Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The word of our God that we wish to contemplate for ourselves this morning is John chapter 17. Let me highlight for you verse 3. Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Thus far, God's word lets you and I continue in prayer. Oh, gracious and merciful Father, we thank you for the opportunity to give you worship and praise on this wonderful day. We ask, dear Lord, for your continued wisdom and guidance in our lives. Help us especially, dear Lord, to grasp this awesome gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, and his resurrection and what it means for our lives. We have a Savior from sin. <coughs> In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I'm going to make a statement. I'm actually going to ask you a question this morning. And I want you to think about what it is that I'm asking and what it is that I said. If you are going to call Jesus a liar, then why do you want to insist that he is your savior or that he is anything to you or to the world. Take that statement in and think about it. And let me just repeat that question so perhaps it will sink in all the more. If you are going to call Jesus a liar, then why do you want to insist that he is your savior or that he is anything to you or to the world? Now, what do I mean by that statement? Well, there are actually a number of things for us to consider in answering that particular question. But I hope before we're done here this morning, you will grasp my point and you will grasp the seriousness that that point is. Our theme will be Jesus the Christ, God. Now, there are a number of verses here that are so very important to Understand, in order for you and I to answer the question that I put before you. To begin, let's just take, you know, take a look at some of these very pertinent words. Let's take the words of Jesus to heart. For instance, take a closer look at what Jesus says of himself. Father, the time has come. Glorify your son, that your son may glorify you. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. For they knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. Now, please, note a few things going on here. First, Jesus clearly states that God is his Father. Not maybe, not could be, not spiritually. No, it's not that he was adopted by God the Father. No, is, nor is Jesus some sort of the imagination of the men around him. Jesus clearly and precisely calls God Father. And to go on from there, Jesus makes a few other startling points. For instance, Jesus prays for glory from the Father. But please note this. The glory I had with you before the world began. With those words, Jesus is referring to his eternal being. He's telling us that he is aware of heaven. He's aware of the glory that is his in heaven. You might even recognize that in these words, Jesus is indirectly speaking of his state of humiliation. You see, he's aware of what he has set aside. You know, the full use of his heavenly power and glory in order to be in this world. Dear people... The only t way to take these words is to grasp that Jesus has stated clearly that he is God's son. Yes, the eternal son of the eternal God. And thus he is God himself. And, and don't miss that one other rather important statement here. For they knew with certainty that I came from you and they believed that you sent me. And again, let that sink in. The disciples of Jesus, really, those who were followers of Jesus, and I think this is perhaps a reference to the 120 believers who would gather together on the day of Pentecost. 
So we're talking about at least 120 people. 120 people were all clearly aware and absolutely believe in the fact that Jesus came from God, is God, and came to accomplish the work of God. Now, what do we do with this? Well, I submit there's really only one option here. You and I are to believe that G what Jesus has said. You and I are to believe that he is the Son of God, the fullness of the deity in bodily form. You are also to believe that Jesus completed the work the Father has given him and that Jesus has been glorified again with the glory he had before he came. So there's no escaping the power and the revelation of these words. Jesus has clearly told us he is God and he is our Savior. Now, you can deny these words as the world tends to do. But recognize this. If you deny these words, then you and I are going to have to agree. Right here and now, you and I are going to have to agree that Jesus was clearly on a deep level delusional. Jesus had some sort of deep psychological illness that would certainly have landed him in a home somewhere today. Now, if Jesus is that delusional, why do you even care about what he said or what he has supposedly done? See, this really goes back to a quote I shared with you a, a while ago from C.S. Lewis, where C.S. Lewis reminded us of the fact that when it comes down to Jesus, you either believe that Jesus is the Son of God, or you have to believe that Jesus was uh, one big liar. And, and that's the issue that's here. Either you believe Jesus to be God, or whenever you deny this, Understand then that you are calling Jesus a liar. Really, you're saying Jesus is a fraud. Now, there are those who claim that what I've just said, well, that doesn't have to really be true and that's not really the way things are. Those are liberal theologians. These liberal theologians claim that the scripture has been embellished. In other words, they say the scripture is God's word, but it's been embellished by men. And really their argument goes like this, that, that pious men over the centuries added things to make Jesus look better and to seem better and to be better. And I assume that they mean better than he really was because you see, nothing else makes any sense in their argument. But I wanna look at that claim, to look at this. Is the Bible not clear? Or is the Bible clear and is the Bible free from error in the record of Jesus and in everything that it says? Because if the Bible misrepresents Jesus, therefore the Bible itself cannot and should not be trusted. So what we're going to do is we're going to note what Jesus says here. For you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of this world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. For I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. Now, when you study all those verses, dear people, what you realize is that all those verses are clearly dealing with how God is revealed to us, clearly dealing with the revelation of God. Yes, with the word of God and the fact that Jesus is that revelation that Jesus imparted to these men, really all the prophets of all the Bible, that he imparted to these men what was and what is God's very truth. And please remember that elsewhere, Jesus made it clear that the entire Old Testament was about him and what he would be and what he would do. So as you put it together, you have to go, in other words, the Bible, according to Jesus, both Old and New Testaments is from and is the complete and the true revelation of God. 
that God, as Jesus said in our gospel reading, or rather in our um, Acts reading, that God, with his Holy Spirit, gave a true and an error-free history of his salvation from beginning to end. And then you go, okay, now what shall we do with that? Well, again, I submit that you either believe what Jesus has said, that he is the revelation of God, the very word of God, or you grasp that you have just declared Jesus a liar and God's word a lie. And if Jesus is a liar, and if God's word is a lie, why do you want to believe in him, or why do you even want to have anything to do with scripture? So let's just confront a few rather interesting things here. Let's, let's, let's take a few simple statements that the world likes to make today. Well, I believe in God, but I don't believe in church. Well, now we're going to ask ourselves, what does God's word say? Yeah, I, I want to know. What does Jesus say? Please note when you study the life of Jesus, that it was Jesus' habit to be in church. And I simply sit back and I say, if the Son of God, the perfect Son of God, felt the need for church, then why do you feel differently? Or, or let's consider what we learned in, the, in Bible class the other day. We were, we were studying the book of First Timothy. And it said this, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. See, that passage says that God is behind the church. That passage says the church is God's possession. In other words, God is the source and God is the power behind the church. And then we hear this, that the church is the pillar and foundation of the truth. Well, dear people, if that's not your church, if your church is abandoned, it stand upon the word of God. If your church doesn't uphold that the Bible is the clear word of God, then you need to find a new church. You need to find a church that says this is God's word. This is the pillar and foundation of the truth. And since God says this is so, then why do you think you don't need the church? And it's true. Well, I'm going to be honest with people when, when they ask, when they say things like that to me. And I just simply say, you know what your problem is? You, you think God is a liar. Because such a statement really says that you admit that you don't really believe in God. You don't really believe in his word. And you don't really believe in Jesus. Because you're going against all of those. Or how about this one? It's very popular today. Jesus didn't say anything about that. And you can insert whatever you want in there. Well, dear people, in truth, Jesus didn't say anything about a lot of things. He didn't have to. Because Jesus made it clear that he came to uphold the law of God, to keep it holy and perfect, and to fulfill it perfectly. More than that, the words Jesus gave to his apostles and evangelists in accordance with the promises Jesus made about the Holy Spirit and the Spirit's work of giving them the truth means that what they wrote is what Jesus said and what Jesus upheld. So the Bible is God's word. Not, not contains, not has some, but the Bible is God's word. So what, what do we do? We study God's word. Yes, we study both the Old and the New Testaments. And you will then understand and grasp God's point of view on a lot of things. Now, I, I hope you have a church that rightly divides and understands law and gospel because that is so important. But I want you to know one thing. Did, do, are you aware of the fact that there's not a single portion of the Old Testament, not a single portion of the law that Jesus declared we should throw out and ignore? Hmm. See, in truth, when you make the statement, Jesus didn't say that, what you're declaring is that the Bible is not God's word and that Jesus, again, is, is a liar. And, and if that's true, why do you care anything about what the Bible says? And if the Bible is nothing more than lies and embellishments, why do you even have a religion or a church that you claim is based on the Bible or on Jesus and you have a church and a religion that denies it? 
I'm not even sure why you bother with the Bible. Or why the world is so obsessed with disproving the Bible. The other day I watched on social media a clip from a Bill Maher show. I forget what the name of his show is, maybe just Bill Maher. And Bill Maher is one who likes to argue that the, if you are a believer in the Bible, well, you're an idiot. You're not even wise. And you go, what? Well, Mr. Maher, if you don't believe in the Bible, shut up. It's my business whether or not I want to believe in the Bible. It's my business whether or not I want to believe that Jesus is the true Son of God. I'm not even sure why you're obsessed with proving the Bible is wrong. In fact, I would tell you that when it comes down to such, and the world is very much involved in this, then that's probably exactly the reason that you and I should dig into the Bible all the more. Because it's clear that the world, which is on Satan's side, is trying to do nothing more than to destroy and undermine the true faith and wisdom of God found in Scripture. The true faith. And, and what is the true faith about? Is the true faith about living the right life and doing the right thing, being good and perfect in this world? Is the true faith just a cleverly disguised psychological need buried in us through evolution? But, but I do want you to know, if evolution is true, then in fact, life and this world really has absolutely no meaning and no purpose whatsoever. Or maybe you and I should actually pay attention to what Jesus has said to us. Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Faith is about the true God. What God has revealed about life and living and dying and eternity. That's what it is to know God. To know his grace and love. To know how this world got so messed up and how, why this world does all the silly things that it does. To know God's plan to take care of the problem of sin and death and hell. To know that God has clearly, precisely, truthfully, and accurately revealed himself and his son in his word. And as I said last week, if you don't believe the almighty God can inspire his word without error, then you don't believe in God. Yes, faith is about Jesus how Jesus came into this world in order to be our savior from sin. That means that Jesus upheld the law of God. He kept the law perfectly. And then he went to the cross to suffer and die on our behalf for sin that you and I might have eternal life. Life, true life, restored to us. That's got to be the point of Jesus. Because anything else short of that is really calling Jesus a liar. So for instance, if you don't believe in sin, well then, leave Jesus alone. If you don't believe in heaven and eternal life, then leave Jesus and the Bible alone. And you go do your own thing. Stop trying to prevent me from believing in God and eternal life. And stop trying to force your beliefs upon me and trying to get me to abandon the Bible. Because in truth, as a Christian, the only thing I'm going to do to you is declare what God says about Jesus, about Jesus and sin and salvation. It's, you know what Christians do? We are going to preach. That's what God tells us as Christians do. Preach, share the message of Jesus. So, dear world, why do you have to try and kill us or destroy us because you don't want us to preach about Jesus and salvation. See, that helps us to realize all the more. Faith is, it's, it's about that resurrection of Jesus, that resurrection of Jesus from the dead, because that's our whole hope and our whole comfort, that Jesus died for our sins, that Jesus rose from the dead, and because of that resurrection, you and I know that everything about Jesus and everything with Jesus is true. And when, as our text 
our verses do this morning. When you hear words like this, they were yours, you gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word, those words are not about living right or following or performing this or that. Those words are about faith in Jesus and his resurrection. Those words are about believing that Jesus is the Son of God and our Savior. Those words are about the promises of the Father fulfilled in Jesus. You know, the truth of, Je the truth of Jesus that is found in our text. I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. In the resurrection of Jesus, the whole comfort and the whole wonder of God's gift of salvation and life is brought to bear upon the world. Now, there it is. These words of Jesus clearly invite you to make up your mind. Either he is God and Lord and our Savior from sin, or, or Jesus is a liar. And he has no bearing on our life or on the world at all. Me, and I know you do too, we believe Jesus, Christ, the Son of God, and that by faith alone, you and I have eternal life in his name. That's what Jesus says in his word. And that is our faith. Amen.